Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm Jason Kuznicki, research fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of Cato Unbound. Joining us today is Greg Lukianoff, president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and author of 2012's Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate, and author of the forthcoming Freedom from Speech. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Greg. Thanks for having me. So first of all, for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar, what is FIRE? Sure. Um, well, this year is our 15th anniversary. Uh, FIRE was founded in 1999 by Alan Charles Kors and Harvey Silverglade. Um, to uh, to libertarian-leaning uh, the, the, the people who, from sort of different political sides of the spectrum at the same time. Um, and they f- founded it in order to battle um, uh, restrictions on speech on campuses. Uh, you know, the, 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 Alan and Harvey were both very active in the early age of speech codes in the 80s and 90s, leading the fight against them. Um, you might have heard of the water buffalo incident at University of Pennsylvania where a student was brought up on harassment charges. Oh, for calling the uh, volleyball players water buffalo? Uh, a, a, a sorority. A sorority, uh, okay. Go home, you water buffaloes. Um, and he uh, and the the fight against that uh, uh, the, that prosecution uh, of the student was led by Alan Coors. So they wrote a book in 1998 called The Shadow University that just catalogs case after case of student getting in trouble for what they say or, or a faculty member getting in trouble for their research for, or for what they say, due process violations, religious liberty violations, and they kind of thought that you expose this, universities really take their uh, identity as a marketplace of ideas really seriously, and you expose it, and you know uh, we're we're done here. We can wrap wrap this up, and uh, you know as of the the expose book. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened was they started getting um, request after request from student and faculty members alike for help uh, for being prosecuted for what they said, for being punished for what they said on campus. So realizing that they needed a bigger shop, they founded Fire in 1999. Um, I joined in 2001. Um, I was a First Amendment specialized lawyer. Uh, I worked for the ACLU of Northern California. I, 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 First Amendment and free speech was my passion. And despite the fact that I spent um, a lot of law school studying the history of freedom of speech, both in the U.S. and abroad, I was not prepared for the kind of things that can get you in trouble on the modern college campus. And one of the interesting things about FIRE is um, you know, we're libertarian here at Cato and I know you do a lot of work with very libertarian organizations but it's not a libertarian organization per se. It actually is a mixture of a bunch of different ideological perspectives. And, and, and it's something we're very proud of at FIRE. Um, I've never even heard of an organization that's internally as uh, politically and ideologically diverse as FIRE. I mean we have atheists working with Christians, working with people who are raised Muslim, people who are raised Jewish, people who are considered – describe as liberals, some who even describe themselves as progressive, some who describe as libertarians and some who describe themselves as republicans. And it's great because the one thing we all agree on is freedom of speech. So it means that we have awesome debates in the office um, and we'll hear each other out and sometimes be like, oh, OK. You know, you know, it, 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 we, we try to model in a sense what we preach. I, I have a quick question for sure. you. Um, I'm actually a huge fan of Alan Charles Coors for two reasons. First, first is for his work in campus freedom of speech. The other is for his uh, his academic work, which is Excellent. in yeah. it's in the you know, the area of uh, the origins of religious skepticism and of atheism, which actually turn out to be a, a sort of inside Christianity itself, which I find very very interesting. But I, I do have a question for you. Sure. Uh, Weren't all of these uh, campus speech codes that were so controversial back in the 90s, weren't they all essentially uh, done away with? I mean, isn't this sort of a, a, a settled issue now? Yeah, didn't we, didn't we get rid of it with uh, the liberal education by Dennis D'Souza and uh, uh, Alan Bloom's Closing America Mind? We, we heard about this so much. You know, yeah. Rush Limbaugh used to talk about it a lot in 1994 and then – we fixed it, right? Yeah, it's funny. Funny you should ask that because that, that's a really that's probably the single most popular misconception that we run into. Because what happened was, you know, these speech codes they start popping up on campuses that you know even five, ten years before had been you know touting how radical they were with regards to freedom of speech, and suddenly you start having speech codes uh, on campus where they say it's like the only way to actually the sort of Herbert Marcuse idea of the only way to have a truly tolerant environment is to start repressing that um, uh, speech that. Is, that is discriminatory or hurtful or uh, or harmful as far as they're concerned. Um, 
And when this got out to the larger public, this was a scandal. Um, this united you know, editorial boards of, of, of everything from the New York Times to the, to the New York Post to the, to, to the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, of course. And uh, the public really was horrified at this. So it lost in the court of public opinion. But then when universities, public universities started uh, passing speech codes, they all got shot down in a court of law. Um, and uh, the last of the first sort of series of it was actually at a private university, my alma mater, two years before I started there, uh, Stanford Law School. Uh, they passed – actually, the, the <laughs> California was so incensed about it. They passed a law applying First Amendment standards to nonsectarian private colleges. And this was in the late 90s. This is 1995. Well, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, a, a student, Robert Corey, challenged the speech code and that was shot down. So you end up having even experts like Robert O'Neill write a book that says, oh, well, you know, they were sort of an embarrassment. Speech codes came and we were – it was embarrassing and they were sort of given a, a proper burial. Um, that's a nice way to look at it but also entirely wrong. Uh, unfortunately, that the uh, the sense that we had won this battle uh, sort of developed a sense of complacency around the issue. So by the time FIRE was able to – big enough to be able to do serious research, we found uh, um, uh, in our one of our first major studies of speech codes on, on close to 400 campuses that uh, around – at the worst, at 75 percent of them had what we call red light speech codes as in laughably – unconstitutional codes. Now, a lot of these places, though, will say we don't have a speech code. <laughs> Look through our regulations. This, there's nothing that says it's a speech code. We're not restricting your speech. What do you say to that? That that is one of the things that did come out of the huge failure of the speech codes movement in the 80s and 90s. It didn't wasn't very effective for the battle for hearts and minds for universities to call this call them speech codes. So in the late 80s, early 90s, it was much more okay um, for like the true believers of this movement to say these are restrictions on speech. They, they, they had sort of the, the, the zeal of the radical. Um, although that being said, all of those codes, they were all harassment-based codes. They just redefined harassment as anything that offends anybody on the basis of race or gender or religion or, or on one of 17 categories. Well, what's what's harassment in the law as opposed to in some of these campus regulations? Uh, harassment in the law, it fires really radical point, I say sarcastically, um, is that, uh, that, that universities should follow uh, a, a Supreme Court case called Davis v. Monroe County um, that dealt with uh, harassment of K-12. 12 students that talks about harassment that, um, and describes harassment as, as something that sounds a lot more like what the term harassment means colloquially, um, that it's severe, persistent, pervasive, um, that it effectively uh, denies someone an education, that it's discriminatory and unwelcome. You follow the Supreme Court's definition of harassment in, in Davis. Fire's got no problem with you. With that, that, that no longer looks like speech. That looks like a course of harassing behavior that's discriminatory. Fine. That's that's what we think the definition should be. Meanwhile, um, at, at these universities that passed them in the uh, in the late eighties and nineties, you end up having this incredibly vague and broad uh, language being used, and probably like the like the laugh line um, uh, that came out of this, the, the most ridiculous one was the University of Connecticut actually passed a ban on quote unquote inappropriately directed laughter. Watch where you're directing that. <laughs> And but what's shocking about it was this was defeated and uh, this was laughed at in yeah. the court of public opinion. This was defeated in a court of law. Um, but amazingly, this policy was adopted wholesale by Drexel University more than ten years later in uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia. More than ten years later, the only way they could have found this code, by the way, to my knowledge, would have been to look for codes that had been overturned. <laughs> you know, it, it, there are several Monty Python skits, and the only one coming to mind is so vulgar that I don't want to bring it up <laughs> right now. But several of them that uh, point out that one of the funniest things in the world is prohibiting laughter. <laughs> and and when laughter is prohibited, that immediately elicits laughter. Absolutely. So I, I may – probably many of our listeners are quite familiar with some of these horror stories because it has become sort of part of the just general cultural knowledge that campuses are – are quite repulsive and some pretty crazy things happen. Of course, conservatives and libertarians might be more aware of that than right. the people on the left. But uh, just to give us an example, do you, is there one that just you like there to tell? Are so there many. are so many. I know. And is there just one that maybe recently you've been working on, or just the, your all-time favorite classic example of, of a student or a professor getting? Can I go through a couple? Please, absolutely. Okay. Unlearning Liberty opens up with talking about one of the uh, one of the all-time most terrible cases I've seen, which involves a student who protested a parking garage via the, the really threatening device of a Facebook collage. <laughs> 
and was kicked out of college for it. Uh, because the, the, the student referred to it as the President Zachary Memorial Parking Garage um, and that was a joke on the fact that the president had constantly, somewhat pathetically, referred to this as being part of his legacy. Um, that's what the joke was. So that this is going to be your legacy. Um, and and what's amazing is when you uh, because we got to get um, a lot of discovery on this case, you know, from, from the entire background of, of what you see is that this was uh, an attempt to justify the, the, the president didn't like the fact this guy was critical of his beloved parking garage program, and he'd been looking for an excuse to kick him out. Finds this thin reed of argument that oh, wait, that's a threat on my life. Memorials usually happen when people are dead, so this guy wanted to wanted to kill me. Now nobody he goes and tells his theory to his other employees. Um, they all go, that's no. You have to you, – freedom of speech is guaranteed. This is a public college. Due process is guaranteed. You can't kick this kid out for, uh, for, for this. But he kicks him out anyway, citing him as a quote-unquote clear and present danger, which is a, you know, adorable from a constitutional now, standpoint. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Poli- political cartoonists routinely oh, yeah. will use devices like putting somebody's name on a tombstone without yeah. it being a threat. Yeah. I mean that's, that's a very common trope. Well, and, and – and, uh, the, the sincerity of the belief that this was a threat, you know, is something that I just, I just entirely reject. And I think probably the most telling part is when they kicked this student out of school, they slipped a note under his door, <laughs> telling him he had forty eight hours to get off campus. It's like, come on, if you think this guy's going to be the next campus shooter, they also uh, you don't slip a note under his door. That's crazy. But the thing that some of the things that made it even funnier was this guy is a decorated EMT. He's a Shambhala Buddhist uh, <laughs> believer. In, like he, he's, he's about as nice of a Kid as, as you could imagine. So, so I, I spent a lot of time on that case. But the reason why I bring it up again in particular is because that case is not fully resolved yet. And it's going ag- again in front of the 11th Circuit. Now, the student has won basically at every step of this case. But the university has fought back and there's been some weird decisions about uh, – because uh, that, that seemed kind of like good old boy network type Georgia type decisions where it's like, fine, uh, President Zachary violated uh, the, the Constitution badly enough that you pierce qualified immunity, which is a big deal. But because this is uh, uh, basically a judge said that, well, you know, this has been going on a long time, so uh, why don't you just split the damages? And so basically making the winning side pay for the lawsuit, um, the, the legal costs of the, of, of the losing side, which is insane. So that, that's going in front of the, the 11th Circuit. Uh, the attorney in charge of that is Bob Corn Revere. So it's, it's destined to be a very important legal case. But uh, more, more recently, um, uh, j- just to give an example of, of how crazy these cases have become, um, uh, and I know that you're a fan of the show Firefly. Of course. Uh, I assume you're a fan of Game of Thrones. Uh, yes, of course that too. We currently have a case where – a um, professor at Bergen Community College in northern New Jersey uh, p- posted a picture on Google Plus of his daughter wearing a Game of Thrones T-shirt that quotes the wonderful and powerful Daenerys Targaryen um, saying that I will take what is mine with fire and blood. Um, this is a great triumphant moment for Daenerys. She's mm-hmm. discovering her strength mm-hmm. um, and it's on a T-shirt. So and this was posted on Facebook, a picture of on his, Google, Google Plus. Google Plus. Okay, so even yeah, even weirder. Five people so saw somebody it. managed yeah. to find that. Well, <laughs> what, what, what's what's funny is that um, the first of all, they put it on Google Plus. Second of all, that um, what it did is it notified the five people who, who followed this professor, Professor Schmidt, um, and a, an administrator received this as an email. Th- Looked at the picture, didn't realize he thought he'd been – he was being sent the picture directly as opposed to just getting a notification that something was weirdly po- posted on Google Plus. And he decided that this must be a threat upon his life because it has the words fire and blood in it because it sounds very bellicose. So the professor is suspended, uh, sentenced to mandatory psychological counseling. This case is still ongoing. Um, at Bur- and there's no process involved. It was just summarily yeah, yeah. suspended. Yeah, no, and and you and it, it, it's downright comic because you end up having uh, the the spectacle of the uh, of the administrators involved inviting staff in to go like, is there really this Game of Thrones show? It's like yes, it's like one of the most popular <laughs> shows in the country. And does it promote violence on campuses? Promotes <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. violence in some way, maybe it, not it, on it, campuses. Yeah. It, it, it ain't for the faint of heart. Um, and but what's amazing is I I get used to these cases that involve. Involving uh, uh, pop culture, we, we had a case that was very similar to this, involving uh, our uh, Trevor and my's beloved show Firefly, um, which was a short-lived sci-fi western that was the best show that ever got In canceled. Yes, yeah, fully so, agree. Uh, actually, I um, should should add that I fully agree. And just to d- diverge for a second, when you think of any Joss Whedon show, you know, like the first six episodes tend to be pretty weak, mm-hmm. and the idea that the first six episodes of Firefly were that good, just imagine where we were headed. Yes, 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 yes. But I any- totally agree. But anyway, so th- there's a, a professor. Um, at 
at uh, uh, at University of Wisconsin Stout discovers Firefly and he's like, this is the best written show I think I've ever seen in my life. And he's a drama professor and there's this great line from the pilot uh, in which the doctor who's about to join the crew um, a, 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 a basically these sort of like space outlaws um, asked the captain of the ship saying, I was like, I don't mean to be rude here but how do I know you're not going to kill me in my sleep? And this is kind of insulting to, to, to the captain and the captain. It's a very big honorable man. Yeah, yes. In fairness to the doctor, he did seem a bit threatened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. And so the captain responds, you don't know me, son. So let me explain this to you once. If I ever kill you, you'll be awake, you'll be facing me, and you'll be armed. So let it sink in. What that means is it's a really tough guy way of saying you can trust me unless you wrong me. Very great Western line. He puts this picture of, of Mal, the, uh, the, the, who's Nathan Fillion, um, for, uh, with Nathan Fillion's first major role, uh, on, his, uh, uh, on his front door of his office. It gets torn down immediately by campus police saying that this uh, – someone put this on your door. It's clearly a threat. And it's like, OK. First of all, I put this on my door. I'm a drama professor. This is a great line. Nobody was threatened. And this is like a nice little old dude. Like he's, he's an adorable little professor. And but he's mad. He's mad that, that they also stole a sign, you know, and, and they they threw it out. Like uh, so, he puts up a sign, really poking him, saying, uh, "Fascism not welcome here. Attention, fascism. <laughs> <laughs> Keep fascism away from children." And uh, you know, and the university, and this is where the one of the reasons why you got to protect free speech so much is because people are so skilled, they're so good at figuring out the logic by which it's like, oh no, I believe in free speech and all, but that crosses the line. They tried to claim that this um, anti fascist statement was actually pro-fascism, pro-violence. <laughs> and it's really what they were saying was it's like, you know, I believe in free speech and all, but I draw the line in criticizing me. And so they brought him up on charges that, that they were he was going to go in front of the threat assessment board. He he believed, he was certain he was going to lose his job. So fire gets involved. We're like I can't believe we have a Firefly case. This is amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a huge fan of the show. Um, and uh, but they, the university really digs in its heels. It basically, it more or less, tries to make the argument that if uh, that we have to overreact to anything that could be threatening. Um, you know, they, they they in a lot of these cases they'll cite like 9/11 and Virginia Tech, and it's like yes, because those were caused by quotes from sci-fi shows. Now, what would have happened if it had been Julius Caesar in uh, the Shakespeare play? The thing is, honestly, from what I do, I. I uh, I could very easily imagine someone getting in, in trouble for having a quote from Shakespeare on their door. Um, that, There's that, nothing – almost nothing would surprise me. No, almost, it sounds like. And the, the thing is I say almost nothing would surprise me but they they genuinely – they generally find a way to surprise me. Mm. So, th But this case had a, had a happy ending uh, thanks to the wonderful help of both Nathan Fillion who retweeted uh, this a number of times and uh, Neil Gaiman. Um, who uh, who knew the professor and, and tweeted a lot about this? Um, the university uh, under the under the siege of brown coats, which is the name for fi fans of the show Firefly, um, just had to had to give up. Well, now that does sound fascist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the brown coat. So let's take a step back here and talk a little bit about these speech codes uh, sure. and and what they look like. How they're I mean, we have some examples. You know, what their terms are, uh, you know, the rating system of fire, how, how these speech codes are are being created and applied sure. in in dangerous ways. Well, definitely the, the sort of classic speech code, um, and has been since uh, since the uh, late eighties, has been a sort of morphing of of the definition of harassment to um, apply to uh, one of the first speech codes extended to any language that quote unquote victimized or stigmatized someone on the uh, on the basis of, of, of protected classes and that makes it entirely subjective on the on the other person exactly because right? so it's like they can invoke it at their belief that something is doing this to them and it makes it really broad it makes it really vague so that was overturned in 1989 in a court in Doe v Michigan but you still have cases you, you still have codes like that. So – and you'll have like the really the really linear ones, the ones that uh, just ban offending people on campus. Um, Jacksonville State University, for example, had, had a code that just banned offending people on university-owned property, which was, of course, laughably unconstitutional, incredibly broad. But there are other kinds of codes. There are uh, – certainly there are restrictions on um, uh, email policies, for example, and at, one, some of my favorite are the – for forwarding of offensive jokes um, is a pretty common one that you see, which is like, what else do you forward? Yeah, my dad would get in a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> I think a lot of people's dads would, <laughs> like my wife's dads would definitely. Um, but th then there's also the, the uh, free speech zones, 
Um, I'm sure you, you, you've heard of this, but if you haven't, um, when I first started FIRE back in 2001, uh, within a couple weeks, I got my first free speech zone case and it was West Virginia University where they're telling students that they could they could protest, sure, but they had to keep it in these two little tiny zones on campus. And what I didn't know was these things were incredibly common on, on college campuses. I think we've, we've found about one-fifth of universities have what we consider to be a wildly unconstitutional free speech zones. And uh, among the worst, um, uh, the one I talk about probably the most is Texas Tech University had a lone free speech gazebo <laughs> that was 20 feet wide for all 28,000 students <laughs> that you still had to apply in advance to use. Um, as I always point out, uh, I had a friend do the dimensional analysis of this, work out um, how densely you'd have to crush down the students and if you wanted to pack them all into this uh, roofed gazebo. And he worked out about the density of uranium-238. <laughs> <laughs> but there's even worse ones. I mean we're, we're fight we just launched a, a major um, litigation campaign with Bob Corn Revere and David Right, Tremaine. Uh, we launched four lawsuits in one morning uh, on July 1st uh, of this year. And it includes a number of challenges to free speech zones. And you might have heard about some of these ridiculous applications more recently because we had three different cases involving chapters of Young Americans for Liberty. One, probably the most famous one so far, was a student who was trying to hand out copies of the Constitution on Constitution Day. And he was smart enough to bring his video camera. With Dangerously they were subversive, Cato. isn't that? They were yeah. Cato constitutions. Were they really? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, good for him. Heritage constitutions. Oh, were they heritage constitutions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it's the same difference. <laughs> Thanks, I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> they don't really belong. Constitution to is the constitution. Yes, lost to no one. So the um, uh, so he so he gets us all on tape because we're used to this stuff, but seeing it actually acted out in real time was kind of amazing. First, a campus police officer comes up and says, you have to be a registered organization. Um, and then he's told to go to a – and he's given all sorts of excuses for why he can't hand out constitutions. And this is a military vet. You know, like it, 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 it's wrong on so many different levels. But then when he goes to an administrator to find out if he can hand out constitutions, he's told um, that he has to use the little free speech zone. But it's not available today, Constitution Day. Um, he could use it in a couple days or he could use it sometime in October. <laughs> um, and it's just it's, – it's beyond parody. The same thing happened at University of Hawaii at Hilo. Students were told that they couldn't approach students to hand them constitutions. And on Constitution Day at another campus, Citrus College, students were told – a student was told he could not protest the NSA outside of the free speech zone, which is just – That's just ironic. Just – yeah, so many levels. Now, let me just briefly sure. play devil's advocate. Excellent. Uh I know that in free speech law, it is permitted to place restrictions on speech uh, as regards time, place, and manner. What is wrong with time, place, and manner restrictions uh, as you see it or or how would you how would you qualify that? Or further? are the free speech zones just time, yeah. place, and manner restrictions? But people always leave out an important word on the time, place, and manner re restriction, and it's the first word that always appears when you talk about them in law: reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, and there's nothing reasonable. No court will ever accept when you turn uh, – and in some cases, we're talking about areas on campus that are tiny, tiny points of a percentage point of, of the uh, of, of the open area on campus. So you know, I think we had one that was like 0. 0.2 percent, 0. 0.2 percent uh, of a campus, 0.3 percent. When these go in front of courts, they go, come on. Like reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions generally mean things like – We'll have restrictions on when you can use amplified equipment. You know, we see those kind of restrictions. We have no problem with it. Um, but when you're saying that uh, time, place, and manner restrictions allow us to restrict spe uh, to, to restrict speech from 99.8 percent of campus, no court in the world will uphold that. And they're right. The, 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 these are shameful attempts to, to uh, take an area of law that actually makes a fair amount of sense. Saying reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions include you know decibel uh, decibel level type uh, uh, um, restrictions. Certainly, any policy that says you can't uh, impede the flow or work of, of, of the university, those are always th those are always fine. Fire has no objection to them whatsoever. But when you try to morph this uh, you know, relatively common sense area of law into something that says that I can now free the overwhelming majority of my campus from freedom of speech, um, that, will, that, that will never hold up in court nor should it. Now, OK. So having established the problem, looking at the crazy cases, free speech zones, uh, it might be obvious to some people, but you've been fighting this for so long and talking to these people and debating people. Mm -hmm. What is the theory that is coming behind of why this should be done? And then, and then secondly, how is that theory – and this is sort of the broader point of, of your book, which I highly suggest by the way. But secondly, how, how is that theory affecting 
students' ideas of what a free society is and should be. So it's a two-part question. Like why are they doing this and then how is it affecting What a terrific students? and thoughtful question. <laughs> um, it, it's something I've, I've talked a lot with uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Jonathan Rausch, mm-hmm. who, who wrote a great uh, a, a free speech book called Kindly Inquisitors back in 19 – also back in 1993. Um, and uh, he, he doesn't see as much of the sort of um, – uh, zealotry around free speech restrictions um, that he saw in the in the late eighties and nineties, where, where it's kind of like it's this moral purity crusade, and I think he has some, something of a point. But my response to him is that yes, it's just become part of the nervous system of the university. They don't even know why they're applying these they're things to a, 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 anymore. So a lot of the cases where you, where you're dealing with it's that, that these speech restrictions got legitimized by eroding the sort of moral force of freedom of speech in the 80s and 90s, and that just allows people to fill it up with whatever kind of like thin rationale, whether it's some kind of vague concern for order that that, that justify these free speech zones. So the the, the sort of intellectual backing for a lot of these codes usually is really not uh, – really, really thin. Like the, the, there's not a lot there. The, you still do have the true believers though who believe that that uh, hateful, hurtful, harmful uh, speech should be stopped at all costs. Um, and I, I'm always happy to debate them. Jeremy Waldron's a big proponent of this. Eric Posner you know, very much uh, ad- admires the European uh, you know, system for, for, for hate speech codes. So there still is some, something of a philosophical backing. It's just not, I don't think, the primary motiv- uh, motivation. So what does this do to our society? So um, in Unlearning Liberty, the second title is uh, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate. And what I think censorship generally does is it doesn't really change people's mind. Um, at least it doesn't make them any less sure that they're right to begin with. And, and it does encourage people to talk to those people they already agree with. Um, and the problem with this is this has polarizing effects. It means that you sort of you, – you don't bother having discussions with people who might disagree with you. You talk to the people you agree with. You become much more confident in what you believe and the, uh, the social science behind these polarization effects is, are very, very robust. You can take a, you know, a group of 10 people. You break them into groups with people that they agree with, have them come back and talk after talking to the people that they agree with and they, they come back much more radicalized um, and this, this can be replicated over and over again. So I think that – I think that this polarization that that's in part uh, for, uh, com- comes out of very good things that we can move to uh, that we have greater ability to move to, to where we'd like to live that we could and we are increasingly moving uh, to counties and even blocks that are more politically homogeneous and you know said in a nicer way uh, you know blocks that share our own values. <laughs> But also, uh, you know, in the in the, in the world of the interwebs, um, we can uh, uh, surround ourselves all day long with opinions that just uh, uh, re- just uh, reflect what we already believe. So we have we have this, and I think of these as being um, very positive things in a lot of different ways. They're the results of very positive things, but I think the net effect is that we end up having us a, a, a more alienated, sort of more polarized country. Now. I think that was going to happen with or without higher education. I think that this is, you know, that the Ronald Englehart talks about sort of like us heading towards the post materialist society, and he talks about it as a positive thing. And I think there's a lot to be said for being able to live in value uh, in, in communities that reflect your values. But unfortunately, but there, it's not necessarily good for your intellectual development. Um, it could actually kind of be poison to it. And the institution that's there to teach us good intellectual habits is higher education. It's the it's the single best tool in our society, uh, with the possible exception of you know K through twelve, which I, I don't think is really up for it, not really not really totally suited for it. So yeah, higher education I think is probably the best. Um, to teach us habits like seek out the person you disagree with, um, engage debate, uh, argue fair, all of these kind of uh, all of these kind of checks on confirmation bias and this kind of stuff. But the problem is they're not just not teaching those things effectively; they're teaching us some of the opposite habits. Talk to the people you agree with. Keep your mouth shut if you have anything disagreeable to say. Don't engage in thought of experimentation if it might offend. Don't engage in devil's advocacy. All of these things that again, the social science on how 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 they improve debate and discussion is. Very, very robust, but universities are falling down on the job. And that leads me to the book that I'm coming out with on September 9th, um, Freedom from Speech, which is a short uh, uh, encounter book's broadside. It's a, it, it, you can read it in one sitting. But it's me talking about what I've seen in the last six or seven months. Um, in the last six or seven months, I, I, I've spent my career defending the rights of students primarily um, to, to speak their minds. And I've been generally optimistic and pleased with where students come from. They, they were generally much better on free speech issues than professors or certainly administrators by a long shot. 
But lately, over the last six or seven months, I've just seen a lot of pushes that are motivated by students to get um, uh, things uh, – restrictions on speech or to get speakers disinvited because they don't like their point of view or to have trigger warnings added on to uh, articles. Uh, or, 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 I mean there was a student at Rutgers who argued that you needed to put a trigger warning on The Great Gatsby. Because it includes domestic violence um, and, uh, and uh, uh, drunkenness or misogyny and all, all these different things, and it's it's weird because it, I I don't like having to debate students on these things. I I, I believe in, in in students' rights, but watching them believe that they have a right not to have a speaker they disagree with on campus is just completely wrongheaded, in my opinion. And the trigger warning stuff it definitely comes from well. I don't think anything is ever entirely motivated by either good or bad intentions. I think it's usually a weird hodgepodge mix. But there is some good intentions in this. But what they don't get is that professors are already getting calls from their parents. They're already getting calls from administrators saying, you did not put a trigger warning on this book um, and therefore you can face disciplinary charges or, you sh or, or you're on warning for not providing trigger warnings. This creates an impossible expectation because keep in mind, Trigger warnings by the own by the def, by their own definition, you, you can be triggered if you're a, if you suffer from PTSD, you can potentially be triggered by anything. Now, keeping that in mind, and then putting on the professor to say I have to warn my students about anything that might trigger them, but anything could trigger them. You put professors in an impossible situation that that uh, I think Connor Friedersdorf probably could say it's wrong. Friedersdorf, yeah. Friedersdorf, I could say it's wrong. Name wrong. Um, the uh, sort of a downward uh, a spiral of people saying, "Oh, uh, my issue is not uh, re uh, receiving enough respect. My issue is d doesn't get a trigger warning." And it's and and I can tell you, it will predictably lead to a lot of professors getting in trouble. But – and a lot of professors keeping quiet and in, in that case sort of uh, really to the harm of the marketplace of ideas that's supposed to be that – that's supposed to be higher education. And is that – that seems very disturbing now that free speech, the, the meaning of it – maybe you always have to keep it burning. But you yeah. like to think in America you don't have to remind people about the values of free speech. But maybe if we look at the history of the world, it seems like you, it actually is yeah. not as common for people to believe in free speech in a really robust way as to believe in restrictions on speech. Yeah. And one thing I'm, I'm acutely aware of is that um, – you know, 20th century American ideas of freedom of speech are very rare in, in human history. Um, I, I always talk about freedom of speech as sort of a technology and one of the greatest innovations we ever came up with. Uh, and and I, I mean I, I agree with John Rausch on you know, thinking of it as more or less an 18th century, 17th century invention that was the bigger Boolean circle around the scientific method, the idea that you debate things out, that you hear other sides out, that you don't trust your intuitions, that all of this kind of like what, what, what uh, John Rausch calls uh, liberal science. Um, it's, it, it explains this brilliantly in his book. And but you can't take it for granted because every, because one of the reasons why it's such a brilliant system is because it under it's realistic about human nature. If I don't like what you're uh, you're going to say, and I can figure out a way to punish you, the human mind is incredibly skilled at figuring out some rationale. And, to, and if you've deposed enough of these, <laughs> these administrators, you can find out. Right? It's amazing. It's like and, and it does and it really does go in a lot of cases. I don't like what you said and I will – and in some cases, it happens literally this way. And I will get back to you in a couple months with charges but you're on charge with something. I don't know yet but I'll get back to you what you're charged with. And it shows this this, this sort of a post hoc rationalization model that, that, um, that I see. But in freedom from speech, what I, my, my, my larger point is that I – you know, Cato is a good audience for this. I talk a lot to libertarians and I – and there's, there's this libertarian optimism that I admire and when it comes to science, uh, I, I agree with to a large degree. But part of my argument in freedom from speech is I believe that there is a class of things that will get worse not just as other things are getting better but because other things are getting better. And one of them is you know, this, this idea that we go out and we seek comfort um, and I think that we can – we have the options of being more comfortable than we ever have in our entire life. But as you uh, – in, 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 in human history, whether it's from pharmaceuticals or choosing your neighborhood or choosing what media you, 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 uh, you follow, 
Um, but I think what comes along with that is an expectation of physical comfort uh, of, uh, 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 and also intellectual comfort. And I talk a lot about the sort of like the, the, the seductive power of, of, of uh, intellectual comfort. It's one of the reasons why I talk a lot about trigger warnings um, and disinvitation season in, in, in the book because what I'm afraid that you, what, what you're going to see is not so much people demanding freedom of speech but freedom from speech. I might be tempted to disagree with you slightly about freedom of speech being a technology because I think in the history of freedom of speech, it's very – very often the case that uh, press freedom in particular arose by accident. Uh -huh. So during the English Civil War, there's this tremendous outpouring of pamphlets and newspapers and debate in print. But that's because there was a civil war going on there and was no there, there, was no, right. there was no effective social control that would allow censorship. A uh, similar thing happens during the French Revolution. These tend to be two very interesting periods in the history of freedom of speech because uh, – there was a breakdown of control and, and it just sort of happened by accident. And I might suggest that uh, you know, when, when people come along and, and establish freedom of speech, they're doing so in reference to these, these sort of earlier accidents. And, uh -huh. and we owe in a sense some of our freedom to, to being able to learn from a happy uh, – Chaos, a, 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 happy you know, chaos. A happy yeah. chaos right. or, or a positive side effect of, of uh, what were two otherwise fairly ugly events in, in history. Um, yeah, it also but, seems that another – point about that era of time mm -hmm. that I think is lost in the terms of freedom of speech helping us live better together because Jason and I were talking about this before mm -hmm. we started recording and it's what we're seeing the exact opposite. Freedom of speech saying that I will occasionally offend you. I will let you occasionally offend me if you will let me occasionally offend you it ends up just being a good way of just living together right. because it, it, you, it, you sort of say disarm you know, I, I will. I will take away my ability to squelch your, you, you know, to squelch your speech that offends me. If you take away your ability, and therefore we will live better together. But on the campuses right now, it's just combative right. constantly. No one has, you know, no one. Everyone has the right not to be offended, right. and so you just have a battle as opposed to peace. Right. Well, with regards to it being a, a, a being a technology, it's definitely something that like it's it's a term I like to use. I'm happy to be convinced out of it. But as you were explaining that, I'm like, no, no, that actually makes it sound even more like. A technology to me because basically most uh, – so many in in innovations come out of accidents happening but then someone learning from it later on and then applying it. So yes, you have this sort of – Penicillin. Yeah, you have mm. this sort of accidental period where uh, the free speech sort of uh, – uh, um, Flourished, kind of, it couldn't be stopped because you know people were hiding, uh, printing presses in caves, and it, it was, and and there was no central authority. But the but later generations turned that into a virtue. Um, they they adopted it in a situation where the you know you, the crown was probably powerful enough by, by the 18th century to actually to, to clamp down a lot on, on this stuff. But that choose it chose not to because it saw a genuine benefit in that um, a, a benefit in that. So and the point about pluralism and peace, um, this is entirely. Left out. This is something that that students do not get, and it breaks my heart that you have to explain that. Yes, the way um, one of the reasons why freedom of speech and uh, let's just call it a great innovation. You know it, why it's such a great innovation for peace is that it. <laughs> you have to remind people. It's like do you know the way people settled things about who was right about God or who was right about authority or who was right about what things weighed yeah. <laughs> or what system. You know the way they they, they settled it in the past. The thirty years. The th the thirty. Years War, you were uh, ostracized, you were kicked out of the community, you were hanged, you were beheaded. That's the standard way of dealing with disagreement for an awful, awful lot of human history. It is a radical idea to say it's like, wow, we're going to peacefully disagree and we're going to settle this through disagreement of using words, not, not actual physical violence. So in that sense, freedom of speech is, is this great victory for uh, – it has these great side effects, but it's this great victory for peace, for peaceful res re resolution of issues. Meanwhile, when you have um, – you know, it, that's why it just blows my mind to see – like after the Benghazi attacks, you had a little spate of – uh, of, of, of ac American academics coming out saying, ha ha, this is why you should have hate speech laws. And I wrote a long piece explaining it's like, no, no, you're not actually talking about hate speech laws um, after the, because they were trying to blame the Benghazi attack. It wasn't attack. speech. It was, uh, yeah. it was actual violence in yeah. Benghazi. I mean, this oh, but, but, but they were trying to blame it on the video. on the um, Right, uh, but, on, but on the, that had nothing to do with it as it turned out. I mean, that. it was yeah. really not related. So they're also wrong and none of them have apologized for it yet. But, but trying to point out, it's like, guys, you, you're not just if you're saying that the that Mohammed video shouldn't uh, should be illegal, you're not just advocating hate speech laws. You're advocating blasphemy laws, 
And th- those were things that it's like – and <laughs> you don't, don't want to put it this starkly. But it's kind of like, and do you know who the first people would be beheaded? Um, <laughs> yeah. You would. Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. you would. Yeah. Like even out of your own self-interest, uh, th- think this through. But it's amazing how basic First Amendment, basic free speech, basic uh, history of, uh, of ideas is st- stuff that's not taught where I have to actually talk to professors about like, you know what would be a great idea? Blasphemy laws. <laughs> it's like, oh, geez, really? Like we have to go with this? basic on this stuff? Yeah, that's that's the point I always make in, in many elements actually. It's a political point. It's a it's a point about principle. One of the reasons you you have principles like free speech is because if you advocate controlling speech, that's a fight that you might lose <laughs> uh, when someone else gets exactly. takes over in power. And that you know, if it's the French Revolution, you know, you you go back between this people to these people and right. one day you might be beheaded, and the next day you might be the beheader, but but you don't want to generally advocate that as a principle. Yeah. There's well, this there's this very great uh, Phrase that Daniel Dennett likes to use in in the history of uh, uh, basically the evolution of ideas that uh, it used to be that organisms would live or die uh, based on their genetic fitness and the, you know, an organism that's genetically unfit doesn't survive and it you know, does not reproduce and it dies and so whatever idea was encoded in its genes dies and nowadays uh, because we have ideas and we innovate at the level of ideas rather than at the level of genes. We allow our ideas to die in our stead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I thought it was Popper. Uh, that, and, and he was drawing on Popper for that. Yes, he's, he's specifically – he is referencing Popper in that. Yeah, uh, it, it, and I, I really feel like you know, Dennett and Popper and all, all of these philosophers are people – are things that – are philosophers that people really need to read more of. But when I think about what I want to write next, I, I, I honestly think I'm getting increasingly sort of like have to get back to fundamentals and explain the basics of this stuff because the, the theory that I've been falling back a lot more on is one that I sort of fleshed out in, um, uh, in, 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 in uh, an article for CNET about sort of the spread of, of hate speech laws in, in Europe and just making the very humble point that there's a value in knowing what people actually think or are willing to say. It's a really important value to have, and the, the, and and when people will sort of paint the free speech you know advocate as being sort of naive, it's like so your polite dinner t- t- table theory of like let's just not talk about it approach. How sophisticated is that? That's You're, your repressed family problem. <laughs> so you haven't talked about it in twenty years, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and it's not about to boil over. Yes. Meanwhile, uh, what, what ends up happening when you suppress speech is you end up with two uh, different kinds of distortions, um, probably more than two, but two in particular. One is the overly optimistic, hey, I cured racism because now it's illegal to say racist stuff. Yeah, good luck with that. See how the, you know, the anti-Semitism laws are working out in Europe right now. I, I think actually they're probably making things worse, particularly when you're playing into a narrative about there being a conspiracy to shut me up. Don't create a conspiracy to shut the crazies up. Let them, uh, let them you know, give their ridiculous theories. I mean there's, there's no theory that does worse when explained in public than Holocaust denial, for, for example. Like people try to bring that up as being like the ultimate thing that should not be allowed. I'm like, I, 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 you know, when you research this stuff, you end up finding it's like, oh, so Jewish specific yellow fever is a compelling argument <laughs> for, for why all those people disappeared. Oh, oh, and by the way, we have tens and tens of thousands of pictures of this yeah. <laughs> too. Its absurdity is on its face and it's best exposed by letting him talk. Right. But just this value, this informational value of speech, um, just knowing um, – it's, it's it, you know, Harvey Silverglate really puts it well and I've been really teasing this, uh, this idea out because I think it's actually kind of profound. But he, he puts it very simply. It's valuable for me to know who the Nazis in the room are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean I, I want people who have bad ideas to air them so yeah. that I know who I can personally disassociate myself from. I mean I, I don't want to be – I don't want to be around people like that, but whether be- they're talking or not. I don't. I don't like the thought that I might be around them. But people also forget. I mean, there was this guy who used to like to poke. Um, I always give this example at, at, at Stanford when I was there. There was sort of this conservative provocateur who would always like poke the very liberal sort of campus body on the on, on the listserv, and he was picking on us for you know our opinion on Second Amendment issues. You know, sort of like the collective campus opinion on it. And uh, and you know it was kind of he made a couple kind of crude jokes and uh, you know a couple lines. And people start writing into the listserv and they start talking about Supreme Court cases, lower court cases I've never heard of. They start talking about philosophers I've never heard of. They start talking about historical incidents I've never heard of. They start telling personal stories about people they've lost to gun violence. They start talking about 
personal stories about people who defended themselves with guns. Um, and it, it, we, we start sharing things with each other that we never, ever would have discussed otherwise. And at the end of this, someone actually wrote in saying, it's like, and that's why I never should have said that in the first place. <laughs> and I just, I just goes like, do you see what just happened here though? Like that, 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 that moment of speech that you all thought had no value was the only reason why we're discussing some serious stuff right now. So you can never know where wisdom is going to come from. It can come from comedians. It can come from failed jokes. It can come from someone saying something incredibly stupid that leads you to think of something incredibly creative. But it's always, but the, the inability to predict where this wisdom is going to come from is the beauty of the system. So it seems you, you had said earlier that that perhaps you have some lack about amount of pessimism, some lack of optimism about sort of the correlation or inverse correlation between material well-being and and how much you want your mental furniture to be organized by laws like free speech. Uh, free speech uh, destroying laws. But so the two questions to I think sort of close us out here are where are we going next from here and is there any hope? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I'm a, I'm an optimist in a lot of different ways. You know, like I but of course I'm a, I'm a Russian opt optimist which means, you know, like I'm always thinking about it's like, oh yay, my village was not destroyed by Nazis. <laughs> yay, exactly. It is good day. <laughs> um so you know, I have this your, sort your of Your parents are Russian, yeah. correct? Oh yeah, but yeah, my dad, yeah, my dad, yeah. he's a he's an adorable little Russian man. My mom's actually an adorable little British woman. Oh, so okay. like it's a very very funny mix. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think of myself uh, too much as a pessimist. But on this issue, I do think that at, I think it's almost like a historical force that if you can expect more comfort and you can expect uh, more, you have sort of an expectation of confirmation in the media you consume, and a uh, and you're being uh, and you ex and you uh, you can expect people to dislike the emotional. Pain of hearing things they dislike, um, or to having having arguments and all that kind of stuff. That's all kind of predictable. And if that is part of human nature, which I think it is, without um, serious education, people will drift more towards wanting freedom from speech than freedom of speech. I, so I think this has a little bit of a character of sort of a, a historical force that we're going to have to fight. But I think it's important for. And, and I could be wrong. I could I could absolutely be wrong. I'd like to be wrong uh, on this. But I think that when people dismiss threats to freedom of speech. Is simply being "quote unquote" political correctness or "quote unquote" political groupthink. I think they're underestimating what we're up against. There's a reason why speech restrictions uh, dominate the world and why America's weird. I'm afraid uh, in, in its protection of free speech, and I'm afraid that's not going to last uh, that much longer. Um, in the, if we don't, if we misdiagnose the problem. Is there hope? <laughs> yes, there's a singularity. <laughs> that, 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 that essentially, I think that part of the hope is that freedom of speech works. It's a very effective system for not just figuring for figuring out not just big T truths, not just the objective truths, but the small T truths, the important ones of being like, do I like you? What's the price of wine? Where should I go for dinner? Like all, all of these kind of things like should I trust you? Well, what are your opinions on this stuff? Free speech is an incredibly effective system. So I think its robustness and what it can deliver, particularly as we become uh, better able to take advantage of, of information technologies, um, will realize that having the data out out there, knowing what people actually think, knowing what they actually uh, are willing to say, uh, will be something that, that its usefulness will far, far, far uh, outstrip any alleged benefit of, of, of suppression. So that's my big hope: is that free speech is a working, brilliant system um, that that hopefully uh, uh, will will go on because of its inherent value. But it's going to require people constantly reminding the population of that. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughts, P-O-D. FreeThoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more, you can find us on the web at www.Libertarianism.org.